Hey everybody, it's the Trout, and welcome to another episode of the Trout Show. Thank you so much for stopping by. Well, if you're watching this or listening to it, you're probably a musician trying to figure out how to get your music out there so people can listen to it on commercials and TV. Even in your favorite retail store, when you go and listen, you're like, who is that playing? Well, you've come to the right place because today I speak to one of the premier experts about sync licensing. Her name is Jessica Collado. Now, Jessica is the assistant professor of business of music up at University of North Texas, which is the largest music college in America. But she also owns a company called Nesco Music, where she helps people just like you learn about the business of music, but also how to get your music out there in sync libraries. And she has a great service that we'll talk about during the video that provides the meta tagging for your song. Now, I'm a musician. I've been a musician my whole life. And just like you, I figured out, oh, I think I've got songs that are good enough for people to listen to, whether it be, like I said, on TV or maybe a commercial or two. And I want to know how I can get to all those people that make those decisions. Well, it's just like anything else. It's not easy. It requires work. But if you watch and listen to this video, you'll learn a lot about how to get just there to the right sources. Now, I'm going to tell you up front, it's like anything else that you have to do. It isn't going to be easy. You're not going to be lucky, and you're not going to be going like, oh, look, I, one person looked at this into my song, and they decided to give me a lot of money for it. That's usually not the way it works. But if you follow what Jessica talks about, and I talk about too, I think it'll help you a lot in learning about sync libraries and how to get into sync music, because it's everywhere, as I said. You might want to grab a pad and a pencil or some other writing instrument because there's a lot of information in here. It's rather lengthy. I'm not going to tell you. We're going to tell you everything in five minutes. But if you want to know about sync licensing, well, then stay tuned to this episode of The Trout Show because that is what's next. Sync licensing and how to get to the right people. That's next on The Trout Show. Here I am as artist writing music and I'm writing instrumentals okay and because you and I both know that everywhere you go whether you're watching TV movies commercials in a Kohl's department store <laughs> music is playing and a lot of times when you hear it you go who is that and it's not somebody we're, we're talking about Taylor Swift it's not like Taylor Swift mm -hmm. It's just this kind of undescript, nondescript thing that people play. So here you are. You got, I mean, let's just start from the beginning. You have music that's good. Let's just assume that the music mm -hmm. is good. What would you recommend for somebody that's just starting out to try to get their music out to people to listen to? Well, I think I go back to the very first thing, which I think is still pretty pretty strong or definitely making a comeback now, you know, even after COVID is if you want people to listen to your music, you got to perform. Right. And then still the largest, you know, revenue stream when it comes to, to, you know, you're getting an income from the music industry is touring. Right. Yep. And that could yep. be local or whatever. So definitely yep. do that. Right. If you're talking about pitching for sync, or um, other media projects like that, you know, there, there's a lot of things to, to keep in mind. Um, I'm going to actually kind of take them a little bit out of order because I, I want to preface with this. Some people think that every sync project, they're going to get paid right away. <laughs> and that's not the case. <laughs> Sometimes it could take a year mm -hmm. before you can actually get paid or a few weeks or months, whatever. But, but there have been cases where you know, you'll go on a long time and you will not see that paycheck that sounded really great in the beginning. So, okay. So and, why, why, and I know working at the recording industry, mm -hmm. what it, it takes months to get your first mm -hmm. royalty check or whatever it is. You write a song a year later. Yeah. Why do you think it takes so long for them to pay people? Is it because it's designed that way or they just, the project you know, goes along? I, I don't think know. if, it varies with what production companies you're working with. And remember, you're not just dealing with the music industry. You know, where it's everybody know, okay, you go to your your PRO or now you got the MLC that pays out, you know, very frequent and things like that. But you're dealing with either an advertising agency or a film production company mm -hmm. or a TV network. Probably a lot of hands that have to go through this, a lot of clearances and things like that. And they probably have to, 
you know, I, I don't know. I don't work in, in that area of media specifically. Yeah. But I think that's probably why it takes a long time. Um, so if musicians aren't careful about kind of, first of all, asking that question first, let's say you pitch your song. So, okay, let's start from the beginning, right? You have a song and you, you hear, you watch a TV show or, or, or something or a movie and you're like, man, I could write just like, or I have a song that'd be perfect for that. Right. You know, the, the way that it was shown to me and that's kind of, it's worked in my favor um, is you reach out to the music supervisor, right? Now, I started this process a while ago, a long time ago, and now, you know, we have sync agents. Mm -hmm. And sure. um, yeah. even as recent as this past year, going to panels at the NAMM show, multiple mm -hmm. panels on sync, and you got one panel saying, you don't need a sync agent. Just pitch directly to us music supervisors. And so you, you got to another... find them. Yeah, how do you find them? That's the problem. <laughs> well, I'll answer that question. But the other people, a music supervisor, are saying, no, I want you to deal with a sync agent because I can. I have a relationship with a sync agent and I can trust what the sync agent sends me. Um, and there's also a process that the sync agent can also double check and triple check to make sure that like the samples are cleared. If you have any samples in your song, the ownership, like they get everything in order before they pitch it to the supervisor. All right. So it's very relationship based. Okay. Now, how do you find the music supervisors? Well, easiest way, first of all, you watch your television show, usually at the end credits, mm -hmm. you're going to find uh -oh. who the music supervisor is or the music library. Right. that they pull the music tracks from. Um, and if you're mostly or primarily an instrumental type, uh, you know, um, musician, you, it's not to say that you can't, your track can't be used on a TV show that uses, that's maybe very popular or whatever. But I know for me, the, the track, the TV shows, I think of right away of like almost anything on the Smithsonian channel. Every time I watch the Smithsonian channel, it's instrumental tracks. Yeah. Right. And so yeah. I would try and like, help if you're a classical musician like look to see what's happening there you know what library that these shows are pulling from and then pitch to those libraries now they might be oversaturated yeah. with certain tracks so you also have to think of that um but you could start at the end credits you could also go on imdb mm -hmm. and just look yeah, at the production credits yeah, yeah right. imdb.com or get yeah. the app and you go right in there go to the show and it's, it's going to list the music department, the sound department, all that stuff. Um, you could also go and um, what I like and I'm recommending now more than ever is build up your LinkedIn profile and just join LinkedIn groups that are tailored toward mm. filmmakers, producers and music supervisors. Mm. And you can actually join like uh, the also the Guild of Music Supervisors, get to know people in those spaces. And within that, you're building those relationships. Because your music has to be good, yes, but if people have to feel comfortable working with you and know that you are responsible and on time because they are on the clock. Yeah. If they need to get an episode out on the air, they need to make they, they can't sit there and ask, go back and forth on an email chain, especially mm. if you're in a different time zone. How are you hey, is this cleared? I need to know your this number, or who was there a co-writer? You know, and there's all that, which is why metadata having it organized and cleared and succinct is essential if you want to make it, you know, in sync licensing. Is that a, and the, and I can keep going. No, no, no. Well, I, and I think, all right. So for those people watching this, uh, I've been a musician my whole life, but it's always been in a band and mm -hmm. been the studio several times writing music for rock bands or blues or something like that. And it was about a year or so ago, I decided to go directly to the instrumental side because I thought, first off, as you can see by looking at me, I'm not 20 years old. And secondly, well, you know, the music business is a look business, you know. And secondly, nobody knows your age when you start playing. If it's an instrumental, mm -hmm. they don't know who, I mean, they might find your picture, obviously, if you're promoting right. yourself and all that. But at the end of the day, they don't. So when I did this, I had no intentions to really sync licensing it. And mm -hmm. I think it was you 
that mentioned it to me, and for those people who don't know, I've known Jessica for quite some time, um, mentioned sync licensing. I'm going, what, what's that? And then you start listening to the music, because I'm in places, and I pull out Shazam and go, who is that? You know, and go, well, that's a cool tune. Mm -hmm. And you might find they have three million people following me, like I never heard of this yeah. before. But then I decided, okay. And then I went to Jessica and I said, all right, what's sync licensing? And, and I have been my whole life in sales and marketing, so to speak, even though I was with big companies. So I know how to sell. I know how to do that because people buy stuff if they need it or they, you know, there's a difference between need and want. So then I started looking into it and then I found out I'm not the only one doing this. <laughs> Lots of other people are doing the same thing. And then I said, okay, I'll start looking into it. And then we got into metadata. Now, I come from the computer world. Metadata is meta is what they you your browser has got metadata in the back and all that stuff. Right. Yeah. Metadata is just the identifier. Yeah. Of, so, some, so I had no idea, being the neophyte that I was, that people actually there's a way that you could take this, put it through something, and you can talk about that in a second, because you do it. Mm -hmm. And that would come out because you as a performer don't really know where the genre is. You kind of do, but you don't. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how to add, oh, it has the flavor of this, sounds like that. Mm -hmm. It's got this mood and all that stuff. So talk a little bit about if you're going to do sync licensing, you have to do the metadata because you're just shooting yourself. Mm -hmm. It just it's it's like knocking on going cold calling door after door after door and maybe one person might listen to you after a thousand to so talk about what's actually included on the mm -hmm. metadata yeah so besides the song name right that's that's important to know um some other metadata you want to include in there you know is obviously the artist name the album name very basic information um the album artist that could usually be the artist's name, but sometimes it's not. Right. Um, and then the composer, that's important. And that should be your legal name, whatever you're using on your, your PRO to get paid, right? right so right. we we could say, uh, you know, we could take a Coldplay song and say, hey, the artist is Coldplay, but the composer is Chris Martin, you right. know, and, yeah, and yeah, there's yeah. a difference there. Um, so, you know, your PRO number you know, or your composer, author, publisher numbers, or they call it the CAE, um, your IPI, your interested parties information, just all these as much identifiable information for people to find you and in, within your organizations that pay out those royalties to you is important. Um, if the song is public domain, you want to make sure that's included in there, that mm -hmm. it is a public domain song. Uh, the year was released. Uh, I'll get to genres in a minute because that can be a little misleading sometimes. Your beats per minute, both the actual BPM, the number, but then also the term is important because sometimes we're working with, um, you know, you could be working with someone who's doing music clearances or music supervision who they may not be as well versed in theory as you think, and they may not be thinking specifically, you know, this needs to be 152 BPM or something. They're probably just thinking medium tempo. You know, gotcha. just something really quick or yeah. fast beat or something. Yeah. So those terms, yeah. you know, you want to embed that in your metadata. Yeah. Um, and then your groupings, you want to put in there that do you own 100 percent of the master? Uh, do you own 100 percent of the publishing? Does somebody else own the publishing mm -hmm. or the master? And I, I want to take a pause and, and really talk about this in a second, because I was talking with uh, an, an individual at the NAMM show. Um, and he asked me, he goes, listen, I'm in a band and there's seven of us, you know, and when we talk about the masters of our song, it's like, you know, we're all in the band together and it's like, that's, that's great. That's awesome. He goes, and, and then I go, but who wrote I know the where song? This is going. Yeah. yeah. You know, and it's one of those, well, you know, we all kind of wrote, it's like, yeah, but who really wrote the song? Yeah. You know, did all seven of you write it? He goes, no, it was really like two of us. It's like, Okay. But there's seven of you in there, right? And you want to give them all credit to the master. And he's like, well, yeah, because we're a band. I go, I respect that. But here's the problem, especially in areas of sync, yep. right? Yep. Or any other project, but mostly sync. <laughs> if you have an opportunity where, let's say, um, you know, in lieu of, all right, we're in an election year, right? So we have a political documentary coming out. The track would work perfect for it, but it's pro maybe a political party or an issue that not all of your band members agree with. Mm. And you're just trying to get paid. 
Right. But if a, if a band member or band members say, no, I don't want the song being a part of it. You can't use the song. That's it. You, you, you lost that opportunity. Right. Mm. Yeah. Because they also own in the masters. So it, it, we have to be careful with that on and how we spend. And it's not a matter of being greedy. You know, it's because no, it's, you're all getting paid. It's, it's a you're business. Getting, Yes. Business. And you're getting paid through your royalties. Right. You know, you're going to pay out the band. But in terms of really who owns and has the authority to say, yes, move forward, because let's say something else happens where you just have maybe you're all in agreement and everything's fine and dandy until that one band member leaves the band. Oh, and yeah. now there's bitterness and resentment. And then yeah. you want to use your track for a song. But because they're still on that master, they're like, no, screw you guys. Three you words, know? three words. <laughs> Hall and oats. Oh yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Come on. Yeah. yeah. So so that's you know so we got to be really clear. You know, think about that. Uh, you know, notice the artists uh, about your masters about that paying out. Well, I want to I want to go back to the very beginning. I everybody I usually talk to, it doesn't matter which country they're in, they are smart enough now to get a, their copyright. Uh -huh. They do get a copyright, but that's where it all starts. If you own the mm -hmm. copyright to the song, you're the copywriter. Yeah. And and then you go to the next, you're talking about pro. So you either have to be an mm -hmm. ASCAP or BMI, and different countries have different pros, but I'm a BMI mm -hmm. artist. And then that actually gives you, from the beginning, and and I, because it's just well known, and I know YouTube does a good job about it to a certain degree, to extremes sometimes, using copyrighted material, they find out you're using because I put tough stuff up all the time. Even I have permission from the artist. I have to go mm -hmm. to great lengths sometimes to get out there. I just say, screw it. I'm not going to be monetized on this video because mm -hmm. it's just not worth it. But once you get the BMI, you got the, you got the copyright and the BMI, then the next level, of course, is whether you want to publish or not. You know, mm -hmm. that, and, and that's, that's a whole different ball game. Because I talked to one earlier this year. In fact, I'm going to call them back again. They're interested in publishing my music because that's another person that gets money. Yes. Because they were, <coughs> excuse me, they, they're very clear up front. This is how it works. Yeah. You have this and you have that. And then yeah. we get this much and you get that. I said, okay. But I yeah. want to tell you a quick story. So back in the 90s, <coughs> excuse me, I was in a band and we were getting ready to get signed. I wrote all the music and we're having a meeting and they started getting, you know, their feet got a little cold and they were like, oh, what's the problem? You're here now. This is where it, you've led up mm -hmm. to this point. Well, this is how I know it goes. We're not going to make as much money as you. <laughs> and I'm like, what are you talking about? Well, you write all the songs. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I go, yeah, and? Are they good? Well, yeah, we use them. I said, okay, so here's the deal. Yes, I wrote this song. I get paid for writing this song, but there's six of us. So if we're, on a, if we're selling, we're, back then they sold CDs still. So if we're selling CDs, mm -hmm. merchandise, touring, you still get one sixth of that. Well, it's just not fair. And I went, okay. I mean, mm -hmm. it's stupid, but you're 100% right when you mm -hmm. were talking to that gentleman, like, who owns the master? Because it's all nice. You may be friends right now, but the other. Oh, yeah. When, when if you hit with the big time and a check is going to be such and such and you're not going to get part of it, you're going to you're not getting any of it either. Yeah. And yeah, that's it's, that's why even if with friends, you know, it's like you got to get it on paper. Yep. You know, and it's not even lack of trust. It's really protecting each other. Yes. You know, that's what you're doing. But um, but yeah, you know, in, in addition to all that, you know, going back to the metadata, you know, other things is like um, the artwork. If there's artwork, you know, that is part of metadata as well. But you also want to add the territories, you know, um, if it can be put, used worldwide, like stated, it can be used worldwide. You know, there's no limitations on, you know, issues or with with certain ter ter ah, territories. But in terms of music tagging, which is also part of metadata, this is where we now look into like the moods and how do we know, how do we describe our songs, right? Mm -hmm. In addition to genre. So one of the things that um, I've been doing with with my companies, helping artists um, organize their metadata. So they'll send me a track. And and what I do is is I run it through an AI software that's that's out there um, that is used with very large music production companies. And it was a very high fee. <laughs> <laughs> to subscribe to this, I'm right? Sure it is. So you yeah. know, gotta get the the you know 
I got to break even, you know? Yeah. Um, but, but I, I, you know, I'll charge like $12 a song. Um, but I'm not just running it. You know, I know there's people out there now who they're like, oh, we'll do your meta data. You pay five bucks. And then they just shoot out an ex a kind of a very not you like visually friendly Excel sheet and just send it to you. You know, my goal is like, this is a one sheet and I literally keep it under one page but enough where you can see it. And then I give additional information based on what the metadata, uh, based on what the AI spits out at me. So um, well, I'll on, give an hold example. On. I just, I know this from experience with you because I've had both done. Don't you then go in and look at it yourself and even yes. massage it more? Yes, that's what I do. So I'll go in and I'll take what the metadata spits out, uh, not the metadata, the AI. And I'll say, okay, it's cool. What this AI does is it's trying to remove the human biases out of, the metadata about out of the song. So I'll give you an example. I worked with this artist from the UK, extremely talented artist. I mean, beautiful voice, um, great stuff. And I had asked her, what is your inspiration? Like if I were to ask you, this is before I ran it through AI or anything. If I were to yeah. ask you, what do you sound like? Or who's your inspiration? She said, Garth Brooks, you know, I have this country Garth Brooks vibe. And I was like, okay, Sure. Let's let's see with AI. I mean, my initial response by hearing your music, I didn't think of Garth Brooks. I actually yeah. thought of a combination between Brandy Carlisle and four non blondes or three non blondes. You know, <laughs> yeah, three non -blondes. Uh, yeah, three non blondes. Sorry, yeah. and uh, you know that combination together, and I was like, "All right, let's see with the metadata." And sure enough, she thought it's going to come out as country. Yeah. And that thing shot out, pop, 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 pop. Yeah. <laughs> Everything was pop. Um, and But what I do like about it is that the moods, based on just, it can go down to like chords. It can go down to tempo. It can go down to just, you know, you know textures and sounds and instruments. You know, all of this. You know, the moods were, uh, for this particular song I was working on with this artist, was passionate, affectionate, emotional, positive, romantic. Mm. You know, it actually gave out like three and I added another two in there to emphasize this. And why are these moods important? Because a music supervisor is going to go and search a library or a sync agent is going to look and through a library of music. And if they're trying to find music for a particular scene that's passionate, they're going to type passionate. And you want to make sure your track ends up on the top of that search list. Right. You know, so they can go and check it out. But if you don't have passionate in your metadata, they're not going to find your song. As perfect as your song might be, they're not going to find it. Um, so, you know, you have the moods. And then what's important, too, is knowing your commercial uses for, for the song. So uh, this AI popped out that commercial music, uh, commercial usages for this one particular song was lifestyle, travel and love. So now you know, okay, lifestyle. Maybe this song could work, you know, on HGTV. Uh, maybe it could work on TLC. Uh, maybe it could work here. Maybe it could work on these reality TV shows or The Bachelor or The Bachelorette. Like, you know, you can start kind of targeting better on where to pitch your song based on these commercial usages. Well, what I like is this, because mm -hmm. I've learned this from my own experience. When I brought my last album out, which is, you've heard it, and I, the very first song I sent out to everybody. Mm. And the difference in opinion on what it sounded like was like night and day. And I, I, I had no, you know, I write and just what I write, I feel, I feel it may have a little mm -hmm. Spanish flair to it or Jamaican or something like that. But most of the time it's like, okay. And people just come out, oh, that sounds like that. That sounds like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm going like, really? So the importance of this and what you said is this thing has takes no it takes the human out of it, and, and that's kind of cold, but it's true because the fact is you've got a song that you think everybody everybody goes oh that's really good that's really good my friend and take it to people that aren't your friends because they mm. they'll tell you the truth <laughs> it's like yeah. I tell, don't listen to your parents kids they they always lie to you yeah. um, when people listen to it and they go oh yeah I didn't yeah that's you I had no idea I mean and then you get a flair for it. But then trying to mm -hmm. figure out who to pitch it to, that's what you do, which makes the whole things different. Because if I'm mm -hmm. sitting there going, oh, I think this could be used in fill in the blank. But then it comes out and says, no, you should use in this. I'm wasting my time. Mm -hmm. So really, when you think about and I know if you're sitting there as a musician, do you do you 
it almost demystifies the whole process to a certain degree. In other words, you wrote a song that you were really good, people like it, but then you're, you start, you know, taking it apart mm -hmm. for the right to, now, if you don't want to use a sync licensing, it doesn't matter. Now, if I write a exactly. blues song, it's like, it can be blues, nobody cares. Yeah. You know, if I'm writing a pop song and it's pop, it's pop. I know it's pop. But when you're writing, right. and this is just what I think, and I think this is what you're talking about, too. If you're writing an instrumental like that lady, although she was singing on it, she thought she sounded like Garth Brooks or had Garth Brooks feel. Well, I have a thousand influences, mm -hmm. you know, and so it's like, well, what are you trying to do? I'm not trying to do anything. And I don't know if everybody else feels that way, And but I just mm -hmm. get it. And I think that's where your metadata comes in to, to save you a lot of time because mm -hmm. it's it's somebody else telling you what, and it's not an A&R person. We were talking about A&R earlier. Right. And here's the thing, though, with the A&I, too, it, the A&I, <laughs> I mean, I keep saying that, <laughs> AI, right? With yeah. the AI is that, you know, we could say it's it's there to take the human biases out, but there's still a human element involved with it because your track, when we run it through the AI, it's being compared to a ton of other songs, yep. you know, with similar tempos and styles and moods and feels, right? So somebody had to put this database in there. And just like before this AI came out, I have a diction, like a glossary of terms, you know, of words to use oh, wow. that I used to write. Okay, I think my song, it sounds like this. Yeah, this is the mood. This is how I feel, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. and uh, now it's this simplifies it a lot because it helps the targeting a lot better. Um, you know, one thing I do that the AI doesn't do um, is I really give a deeper ad and media example. So I'll actually craft one for the artist based on the commercial usages. Really, it's for the artist to help pitch themselves. So um, we talked about travel and lifestyle, right? So I'm just going to read one here really quick that I did for, for this artist um, I said this, and I try to use the same moods in the language, right? So I put this, this affection. Is our, this is post metadata. That post you've already post AI. Okay. Yeah, okay. post AI. This is now me. Yeah, yeah. I go in there. Okay. Um, and I'm like, this affectionate pop track may benefit a lifestyle and or jewelry brand that showcases how the lifestyle or jewelry product serves as a tangible symbol of affection and commitment allowing couples to express the unique love languages. So I'm like trying to put everything together because mm. I have put my music in specific libraries that ask me for track descriptors. Um, you know, this is very specific to a commercial usage. The artist doesn't have to use it if they want to, or they can tweak it, but it's just kind of giving them a foundation of saying, when you describe your track, and somebody says, why should we use your track? Or think about if you're an ad agency and you're yeah. listening, why should we use this track? You know, well, th this track does this, does that. Um, so the uh, other things that the AI spits out too is like just the primary instruments. It won't list every instrument, but then you can go in and add more to it. The key is important. And I love this one, the decades. So even though something is written in the 2020s, right? Yeah. It'll come out as like 1950s. Mm, if yeah. it's just done the right way, it'll say this, this is a 1950s decade. Uh, so it's not that music supervisors have to pull something out from the 50s. If it sounds like the 50s, like I remember when Leon Bridges came out, his first album, I was like, whoa, this is what a throwback. And it was a very modern album. Yeah. But um, yeah, so things like that, you know, I organize it in, in a one sheet and then I send it back to the artist and it says, this is for your record, for your keeping. And it. And on top of that, I also ask them to send me their PRO information and so I can organize their groupings. Right. And if, if a music supervisor or sync agent or somebody says, hey, do you have, you know, this information? All you have to do is, sure, send them this PDF of all your information, nice and organized, um, not, in, not in a crazy Excel, uh, Excel no, sheet. You no, know, it's I'm just one it's doc. Very, it's very well done. Yeah. And just sending it in and, um, you know, going from there. But one thing I have noticed, and I've even done this for my music, is you start seeing a trend of your sound. So it really does help identify your voice. Yeah. you know, certain things. Um, I primarily write in Latin music um, and Latin urban styles. And, you know, one of my first big sync um, gigs was for a reality TV show 
on Mexican boxing. I'm not Mexican. I'm <laughs> Cuban, Puerto Rican, but it was a lot of Latin music. Yeah. And I did a lot of that show. And then I just kind of fell into this space where it's like, just because you're Latin, go to girl, do Latin music. Oh, yeah. So I, I started creating more Latin electronic stuff or, or kind of what I thought was lo-fi with certain things. And, and I put in, then I'm running my stuff through metadata and the word Latin is not even coming out. <laughs> and, and, and like my musicology brain can come on and be like, that's inaccurate. That's wrong. But I also have to think about the business brain and that if a music supervisor does not know the genre but they but they may listen to like spanish gypsy guitar or whatever and it reminds them of chill music or more relaxed music yeah. or ambi or just world or something and not specifically latin like the way i'm thinking about it i have to remember i have to cater to that so my tracks are coming out chill like a lot of them are chill so i just write chill latin <laughs> Chill out. Like I'm adding that Latin to it because I know what I'm doing theoretically with Latin music in it, but I'm keeping that chill element in the metadata. So they know if they type up chill, my track's going to come up. It, it still comes down to human listening and deciding whether they want to use it or not. I mean, Absolutely. It's, it, it's where it all yeah. comes down to. And, and, and it's kind of like, to me, it's no, we were talking about A&R, A&R people. Mm -hmm. it, they, they are really an A&R person. But except they've already, mm -hmm. they got them. It's not like an AR person that's trying to find the next big band or next big singer or whatever. They've got right. a need. They've got a niche. They've got to fill it. They've got to put somebody in there. And I, I just, I, you start thinking about all the places that use music. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, t a ton of stuff. And, but then you take it and you still, but you're not pitching yourself. That's the sad thing for mm -hmm. me. You're, you're, you're sending it in. And really, it's a good bad news. There's no, they're they're not looking at you. You know, mm -hmm. years ago, I knew somebody who worked with Michael Bolton when he was so famous, and his first album, he hired models to be the band because he knew it. <laughs> so they weren't even in the band, but he knew that they would look at the album cover and go, "Okay, maybe I should listen to it," and that's what they did. So, you know, yeah. now it's not like that to a certain degree, but I mean, when you sing, sing music, they don't, they're not listening to that. They don't, I mean, to a certain degree, I would assume that they look at the yeah. metadata, they, they know a style. I'm sure it's, it's like you just got through saying, you get picked up, people know a style. I mm -hmm. need a song, it's like acting. I need an actor that can do, it reminds me of so-and-so. Yeah. And I, and I, and the interesting thing about it is when it comes to music and anything, there's no... Yeah, there's new pop stuff. I mean, there's new weird stuff. Your next iPhone commercial will be some weird thing that you can't figure out who is that. But then they got stuff from the 50s in there, mm -hmm. or you know, or you got something that's the big band sound. You're like, okay, mm -hmm. it all depends the mood that they're doing. Yeah. But and, I, I'd like to say this real quick too. Mm -hmm. If you think you're going to throw this out and people are going to, you have to work at it. I oh, mean, this absolutely. is a job. This is a job. I mean, I, I was talking to somebody the other day that I interviewed. It was a UK artist. She'd been one of the top country artists in the UK. And she said she's mm -hmm. trying to get her music on more international stations. She says, such a slog, you know, because you have to work at it. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't, you can't hire an agent. Well, you could, but you're not going to feel, I need to get my music on and fill in the blank. Honduras. Yeah. Uh, Indonesia. <laughs> I mean, Japan, you know, yeah. so. That it's all about how much time you want to put into it. If you're a good artist. No, absolutely. And, and you know, man, you said a lot that like, I, go, oh, I had, a, had a comment about this. I had a comment about this. And now like, I I'm lost sorry. my train of I'm thought. Sorry. No, no, no. It was, it's all good stuff. And um, well, going back to Michael Bolton album really quick, you know, we talked about like having the models as a band. I go, it's yeah. going to get to a point where avatars are going to be the next artist. Oh, sure. Where we're not going to even have like a, real it's going to be a human behind it but the actual person yeah. that the fans are falling in love for is an avatar of something yeah. you know ai and, generated and, you know, yeah it's it's kind of yeah. like uh I, I when they started bringing cgi in movies mm -hmm. that now you go to the movie theater if it's like and i i told mm -hmm. people this years ago when shrek came out which was probably the best one that came out and then it started getting better and mm -hmm. better 
I said, eventually people, will, because then you hire people like the old radio days, but they were hired for their voice. Nobody even knew what they looked mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. Eventually, then movies will go the other way going, our movies have actors in them, real people in the screen. <laughs> and they're like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know, and I think that's the way electronic music goes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I see a lot of people doing hip hop, you know, they're doing beats all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm going to throw beats down to stuff. Well, it's a different genre. I don't do that at all. But I mean, eventually that's, I think the human part's eventually going to come back around again. But still, mm -hmm. a supervisor somewhere is listening to that. <clears throat> and I think I told you this before. I had a con, con, uh, acquaintance of mine in California wrote for movies. Mm -hmm. And I said, what's it like? He said, well, what's great is you spend, you know, three days on a song that you think is wonderful. You go in and you're sitting there with the producer and the director. They go, eh, we don't like that. <laughs> so. Well, that's that. There you go. You triggered the thought. Now I remember okay. what I was going to say. Well, okay. well, two things on that topic. So one is, you know, I would encourage if, you know, if you're an artist listening to this and you're trying to get into the sync world or you're like, you know, my gosh, it's just so saturated. I've pitched to sync agents because some agencies make you pay a monthly subscription and there's no guarantee that your song is going to get selected for whatever project. So you're All just right. putting money out there. If you got to put your entrepreneurial brain on, right? And you got to go out and, and start connecting with the actual boutique marketing agencies themselves. If you're in a small town or uh, I'm just using this as an example, I mean, it can work right. anyway, but like, who are your marketing agency, your ad agencies? And, you know, put together your EPK and, and you know, go and walk with you and just really introduce yourself and start building these relationships with people where that's they don't have to go out and- That's something I never thought about. Just go, you know, and I mean, that's the something worst, you could put a gun, could go into an agency and go here. You, yeah. I mean, and they may reject you. They may say, well, yeah, but, but guess matter. what? Just go out there and, and ask them because the chances are, let's say somebody does listen to your album one day or a song that you leave behind or something like that. And they're like, you know what, this would be perfect, you know, but it's one of those that it doesn't hurt to be proactive and just go out there and connect on them. And it doesn't cost you anything to do no, that besides your gas and time. your time. Right. Yeah. Um, but I think that's something when it comes to time, that would be time worthwhile, like to use your time to do that, but start on the boutique level, you know, and work from there. That's point one. Point two Yes, you can. I, I can tell you from experience, I have been at the final round of a major sync project, big one. And I followed the brief, you know, when I got the phone call from the, the music, the, the music house that hired me out of New York. And they're like, Jessica, this is it. They send me the prototype commercial. The commercial wasn't even fully done. Like it was completed, but the CGI hadn't been put in yet. And I was like, wow, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm here for this company. This is such a big ad. And, and I did everything. And I mean, and if you don't have a quick turnaround time as an artist, rethink doing sync at a, um, like either at a spec level or just want to be out there as a composer, just pitch your songs. But um, what the work I did was, you know, sometimes I get a call and they'll say, hey, do you have something in your library? And I've developed relationships with music supervisor and sync, you know, agencies or mm -hmm. music houses with the, you know, they call them and say, uh, no, but I can whip one out for you in like two hours. You know, I have something and, you know, I can I kind of have my templates and I can go in and give you what you want. And so, you know, I'm working back and forth and it was a very stressful 48 hours. And then, you know, go and I find out, you know, I get a text message with, hey, you know, it's like, it's your track is like right there. You know, it's, it's all that we're all excited because everybody would win in this, you know, the, the music house, those guys get paid, I get paid, it would be great. And next thing I know, it just went crickets. Like I didn't hear about from anyone for a week. And by that point, it's kind of like, well, we know this is, you know, I didn't get it. And I was like, what happened? Turn on the TV, Super Bowl Sunday. And there's the commercial with no music. <laughs> <laughs> here's the thing. It they was just, more they sound design. To, but, oh, man. But here's the thing. It was more like sound design than it was like what their creative brief, what they wanted. And so in the ad world, that's one thing I learned really quick. It's not that I made a bad track because it's very easy to beat yourself up. Oh, oh man, sure. I made a terrible track yeah. and all that stuff like that. 
you know, it's it, what was kind is I still got paid some money from the music house and, and then it stayed in their library. So we're going to pay you a portion. It was nothing what I would actually get from well, the Super Bowl. Just, right, can we ask <laughs> it? What would have been the big number that you were going to get? I would say it would definitely have been five figures. Oh, man. Probably. Yeah, I would say I'm, maybe along I'm hurting. That line. I'm feeling painful now for that. Yeah, yeah. It, it, but this was long time ago. So if if it wasn't, I would say it would be five, maybe close oh, to that for, still, for that's something. A lot of money. Yeah. So anyway, this was this was really something where I was like, well, it happened. And I'm watching this commercial and I go, what happened? And they have the right to change their mind. Sure. And so that's the other thing that you have to keep in mind when you go into this world of sync and, and writing for, for just film and television or ad agencies, because they can come up with one idea and then tomorrow they change their mind altogether. There have also been very, it's kind of sad to say, but situations where they'll hire professional composers and they'll listen to these tracks. Oh yeah, these are good. These are good. And then they hire their, inter their internal composers to make a copy track. Yeah. yeah. And then you never get paid for it. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's can be, you know, pretty dirty, right? That they do that sometimes, but it is a business. Doesn't mean it's ethical and certain things like that, but you know, you just got to keep going. You know, it really is something you have to do all the time and like make exercise some time management and, and do that, but don't dismiss other sources of income to sub oh, you no. know sustain your music career yeah. you know keep playing keep touring keep writing you know um if you can give music lessons or do coverage like i just finished doing some drum programming for a film yep so Maybe you know that, it's yeah. kind of like hey that's fun i'm a drummer and i was like i can do this this is great Well, that's it for this episode of The Trout Show. Thank you so much for stopping by. A very big special thank you to Miss Jessica for coming on to talk about Nesco Music. And remember, if you'd like to know more about the music business or need to know more information about sync licensing or metadata, you go to her website, nezcomusic.com, N-I-Z-C-O music.com. She can help you out with everything. She's easy to get in touch with and very, very knowledgeable. And remember, if you want to know more about The Trout Show, all you got to do is go to our website, TroutShow.com. Everything's right there. More information about all the YouTubes we've done. We've done dozens of them. And also, all the podcast information is there, too. So if you want to know more how to get, you can listen to this or watch it on YouTube. You can find it right there on TroutShow.com. So until next time, people, you know what I always say. It's only rock and roll. But I love it. See ya. See ya.